Take four of the Volvo Ocean Race lived up to its billing. It's a hell of a way to make a living. Through the Southern Ocean and round Cape Horn, the fleet was battered by screaming winds and towering seas. I am never, ever, ever doing this race again. For Movistar, it nearly proved too much. This boat is going down. But it was victory again for ABN AMRO 1. Rio de Janeiro, the prize at the end of leg four, the longest and most demanding in the Volvo Ocean Race. Leg winners ABN AMRO 1 have been soaking up the sunshine for the best part of a week. But for one boat, the splendor of Sugarloaf Mountain has been a long time in coming. After surviving a major scare en route to Cape Horn when water flooded into the boat through the keelbox, and undergoing emergency repairs in Ushuaia in southern Argentina, Movistar finally arrives to join the rest of the fleet, an epic 26 days after leaving Melbourne. Not for the first time, Movistar is plucked from the water, another intensive overhaul ahead of it. It's looking pretty good. Looking very good, actually, considering the boat's done as many miles as it has. Supervising work on Movistar's troublesome keel is Russell Bowler of Far Yacht Design, designers of all but the two ABN AMRO boats on the last leg. Despite the far boat's frailties in the first four legs, the designers' confidence in their work remains unshaken. We've gone to every place and every port and looked at the problems and, and to see whether they were actually, uh, are these boats seeing loads that we hadn't predicted? But uh, in every case, we're quite happy that we have done the engineering correctly and really it's just a matter of uh, secondary detailing that needs tidying up and we'll do a few things differently next time. Of course, you learn from all these incidences, but the, the basic structures are just fine. Two places below Movistar on the leaderboard, Ericsson's crew reshuffle continues. The health checks at the end of leg four were routine enough, but moving Neil McDonald to watch captain in favour of new skipper John Kostecki was not. I'm committed, as I always have been, to get um, Ericsson a place I believe we deserve. We haven't had a great regatta so far, and we clearly need to improve upon that. So yeah, I think it's, it's, um, it's a new start for us. In the most recent change, Ross Halcrow, a race winner on Kostecki's Ilbrook four years ago, has been brought in at the expense of Jason Carrington, crewman and Ericsson's construction manager. Bowman Tom Braidwood misses the next leg with a shoulder injury, but frustration at Ericsson's lack of performance continues. I think it's it's never one little thing, you know. We we certainly have a boat speed issue. You know, boat speed comes from a lot of factors. You know, it can be it can be rigs, it can be sails, it can be the hull. You know, I mean, it's hard to think it's anything to do with the hull or the underwater because our boats are out of the same mould as the pirates. Um, except our boats being built a lot more meticulously and a much nicer job. We've got to look really deeply at our whole team and find out why we have a speed problem. It's a mystery, I don't know, because everyone's racking their brains and, and hopefully we'll turn around and come up with a good solution. Four legs down, five to go. Time to reflect on four and a half months of action and adventure. After more than 20,000 miles of ocean racing, the start in Vigo seems a long time ago. Nobody can win the round the world race tonight, but you could lose it. Paul Kayard's warning goes unheeded as the fleet is unleashed into the teeth of a North Atlantic storm. Movistar and Pirates of the Caribbean crash out with structural damage and keelbox problems. This is like a cannon shot that went off. It's extremely loud. 
We just had a little fire on board. Yeah, this is the bit that was on the brochure, actually. Uh, well, oh. Mike Sanderson's Avian Amro 1 sets a new 24-hour speed record. We're out of time, but we just did 532 miles. Beautiful, beautiful. And atones for last place in Sanchenzo by leading the fleet into Cape Town for a team 1-2. Rivals vanquished, boat vindicated. You know, we had our ups and downs, we had to tough it out to the import race, and we believed in the boat, you know, and uh, it's huge. Fallible on the first leg and fearful on the second, the Volvo fleet runs into trouble again. Deck delamination on Brazil 1, keel ram failure on Neil McDonald's Ericsson. Um, certainly, as it stands right now, going into the Southern Ocean would be ludicrous. Uh, you know, that's what we came down for. It's just what this boat's designed for. It's all good. As the westerlies kick in, Avian Amro 2 kicks on, breaking Mike Sanderson's speed record in pursuit of the senior boat. 550 miles on a white boat! Yeah! Keel problems return en route to Eclipse Island, forcing Movistar to bolt to Albany for running repairs. Pirates follow but can't make the pieces fit. Well, was wrong, the drawing was wrong. Therefore, it does fit. Two days later, Brazil 1's mast collapses, leaving Torben Grail's men floundering towards Fremantle. It takes a five-day outback odyssey to get the boat to Melbourne. Back on the water, it's another triumph for Team ABN AMRO. Juan Kumajan's design looks invincible in moderate and heavy airs. The winning skipper's elated but exhausted. It's been the most intense three weeks of yachting in my life. <laughs> Six boats start the leg three dash to Wellington after Grant Warrington's Brunel withdraws to relaunch its campaign in Baltimore. The trip across the Tasman Sea proves testing and tight. After four days racing, the leg produces the narrowest margin of victory in Volvo Ocean Race history. <laughs> Movistar pips ABN AMRO 1 by just nine seconds. Forced to bring in its shore crew to repair the boat again in Wellington, the Spanish entry incurs a two-hour penalty on the leg four restart, but the work fails to last the distance. Ice gates keep the fleet clear of trouble on the return to the Southern Ocean, but the time-honored challenges remain. Ocean, the church went boys into men. Less than 200 miles from Cape Horn, Movistar starts taking on water rapidly through a damaged keel box. The level reaches hip height before emergency pumps can be started to save the boat. Movistar's leg four challenge is over, and realistically, any chance of challenging ABN AMRO 1 in the race overall. There she is, the horn. <laughs> After rounding Cape Horn, the fleet bunches up in light, changing conditions that test the patience of the navigators to the limits. But even in the light, ABN AMRO 1 proves hard to reel in. And while the battle rages for second, third and fourth, it's Mike Sanderson's men who are first into Rio. Four legs gone, it's the black boat that's dominating the race. 
14 points clear they may be, but with lighter winds ahead of them. Pirates of the Caribbean now fully up to speed. Movistar back on track and a rejuvenated Ericsson in prospect. They're still a long way from home. But the Volvo fleet's immediate concern is the Rio Inport race. Lighter winds are forecast and that's expected to favor the far design boats. The Brazilians in particular will be looking to use their local knowledge to challenge the dominance of ABN AMRO. Mike Sanderson's ABN AMRO 1 raced into Rio ahead of the pack to take the fourth leg of the Volvo Ocean race and tighten their grip on this competition. Lying second, their sister boat, ABN AMRO 2. This is the surprise package of the race. But along with Brazil 1 could find themselves on the start line for the import race with a huge disadvantage. Their light weather sails are unlikely to arrive in time. Basically, the problem is that we developed some light air sails for inshore sailing you know, near the coast, which is quite a lot of points in the Volvo race, especially with our boats. You know, we don't perform too well in light air, so we, we really depend on these sails. So uh, we chartered this plane uh, to fly directly to the most southern part of uh, Brazil. That's the first port that is Rio Grande. And in Rio Grande, we hope to uh, meet the, the big vessel with our container on it. And then hopefully we are allowed to, uh, to collect the sails out of customs there and bring them to this plane. It's not just the fact that we need to get the sails and put them on the boat. We have to check them over, we have to put patterns in them. We also have to have to pack the spinnakers and uh, also be good to get them out and have a look at them before we want to use them, you know, to make sure there's no holes and, and just to double check everything. With all eyes on the clock, the customs inspector opens the container to give his approval for the sails to leave the dockside and be transported to the airport. As the sails are about to be loaded onto the Rio-bound aircraft, the pilot suddenly has concerns about the size of his cargo. It, this will all fit in one flight container. Yeah. Normally. Quer fazer o teste de repente? We can roll this up and try if you like. I think we will manage. Uh, it's completely packed to the to the roof of the plane, full, completely full with all the all the sails, and we won't fit in it anymore. <laughs> so, so it's just the pilots that have to uh, crawl over the sails and then get into the pilot seat. And then uh, you have to uh, open the door for them to get them out. But finally, the sales arrive in Rio and the preparation for the import race begins. <laughs> in Rio, race director Andy Hindley is aware that the afternoon ahead will be a challenging one. Oh, no, I think it's in the knockout now. What country? They look really big here. You can't even the water. Both go racing around and they look really small all of a sudden. But uh, here we've got an anchor on the bottom. In nine to ten knots, it's easily sailable. It's the right wind for the fire design boats and not the right wind for the um, Kwan boats, so I.e. being Amro 1 and 2. Well, if they win today, they will thoroughly, thoroughly deserve it because it's not their condition. So, um, but anything can happen. Wait and see. Top marks in. Top marks in place. Of course, it's completely clear the wind is perfect, and if this continues all afternoon, we'll have one of the best races we've probably had so far. Time for the racing to get underway. In the commentary box, international yachtsman Chris Law. Race build up, breezes 10 to 15 knots. Lovely backdrop of Rio de Janeiro. Ericsson under pressure today to perform under their new skipper, John Kostecki, the winner of the last round of the world race. Okay, let's go, Tremont. 
Tremont. On board Pirates of the Caribbean, Paul Kayard asking for more speed. Tremont on up. Tremont. Yeah, full speed. Tremont. AB and AMRO 1 making their final run at the line. Standby gun. Movistar coming into the lure. Two, one, gun. Gun, great start. Kaird got a good one. Torben Gale and Brazil didn't. They're out the back. ABN Amro 2 also struggling. Ericsson safe to Lured, but full chat. So Ericsson to Lured going well. Movistar in the middle, but punched his ABN Amro 1 and Kaird in control to Winward. Okay, approaching the top mark, first time. ABN Amro 1 clear again leading the inshore race but brazil look vulnerable here brazil coming in on port tack must keep out of the way of pirates of the caribbean and movistar coming in on starboard they have wind from the right means they're in the right in sailing terminology brazil tackle here to lewis but they're within two lengths of the mark so if movistar have to alter course to avoid them brazil are in danger of being penalized they might also hit the mark Brazil are laughing. Movistar have to keep clear. So do Pirates. Brazil are vulnerable here. On board Brazil. They didn't hit the mark as far as we could tell, but protest. Protest from Movistar. Brazil have risked it in their home waters, trying to do well. They should have gone behind both Movistar. Whistle. Umpires have penalized someone. Flag. It's Brazil. Oh, no. Brazil have been penalized in their home port. Brazil will have to do a complete penalty oh, turn. He got a penalty. You've been penalized. Okay, don't worry, Earl. Let's sail the boat. If you've been penalized, you have to take your spinnaker down and do a complete 360. That's attack and a jibe. Marcelo Ferreira, Torben's Olympic crew, so disappointed in front of the home crowd. Heartache for Brazil, just trying to push it too hard. End of the first lap. ABN AMRO 1 out in front again, even in the light air. Cool, calm, collected, looking fantastic. But Paul Kayard with Pirates of the Caribbean are not so good. They have got problems. The Halyards. The Halyards bone. Daggerboard's down. Movistar goes through to Lured. Movistar into Halyard. second. It's Ooh. not? Is it or not? Now it's ra it'll wrap it again. It'll wrap it again. Okay, stand by to bear away. It's caught a hank. Well, what do we do? All right, here we go. Boy, problems here. They'll lose valuable points. Movistar now out in a clear second. Ericsson up to third. That's their best finish for a while. Ross Halcrow on board, the new trimmer. ABN Amro 2, still struggling at the back. But round the top mark for the last time, it's ABN AMRO 1 with a sleigh ride to the finish. Big boats, these, built for the Southern Ocean, built for round the world. They're contained, held back in shore, but being sailed beautifully. Movistar coming to the top mark now for the final time. They're in second. They look safe, but it's tight the next places. Ericsson, though, is going to get third. If she doesn't make a mistake downhill, that will give her the podium finish she desperately needs. Look at them try. But it's tight at the back for fourth, fifth, and sixth. Just in front in fourth is ABN AMRO 2, followed tight by Kayard, and they're on board Brazil. They're close in sixth. Fourth, fifth, and sixth is tight. But out in front, showing the way to do it, is ABN AMRO 1, sailing beautifully in this round the world race, totally dominating. And when restricted inshore in this supposed light condition, they still dominate great result for them and their team but the yellow race winners flag goes to the day to mike sanderson and the abn amro team that's the way to do it so a win for mike sanderson's abn amro one it appears his crew can do no wrong in this race movistar will be delighted with their second place after their recent problems and Ericsson will gain confidence from finishing third. There'll be an inquest at Pirates of the Caribbean after coming home last. It's not pleasant to go through, but you have to keep your chin up and uh, keep going. And 
you know, in the big scheme of things, it's hopefully a minor, a minor setback. Uh, we still have a good team. We still have a good boat. I mean, everything was going great for the first couple laps. We were racing well. There's just more evidence being gathered at ABN1. It's just simply faster. The stunning in-port race victory for ABN Amro 1 extends their lead in the Volvo Ocean Race. Mike Sanderson's men are now 16 points clear of ABN Amro 2. Pirates of the Caribbean lie third, with Bauer Becking's Movistar just half a point behind them in fourth. We just knuckled down together and said, hey guys, everyone expects us to come last today. Let's, um, let's step it up another gear. Let's everyone just do anything they can to raise the intensity and um, see what we can pull out of it. Any point we got today was a good point. Um, but, you know, we just, the guys just did such a fantastic job today. It was just a, a pleasure to watch from my position. And um, they didn't put a foot wrong all day. And that was what happened, you know. That's what got our lead bigger. It's nice that, that we actually pulled it together today and I think we just stayed calm and a lot of people made a lot of mistakes and just got into second place but we were happy with our speed as well. We are going good upwind and we were actually very quick downwind and we still know there's a lot of downwind that's going to be a race in this race so it gives us a lot of confidence. Absolutely exhausting. Of course the ABA, ABA one boys showed us their uh, Fast aside again, and uh, the movie star guys, what a great turnaround for them, but um, certainly a, a, a great day for us and a um, good place to start rebuilding from. Uh, hopefully you're going to see a little bit more of it. The race restart fast approaching, the Volvo crews take their last lingering look at Rio. True to form, Pirates bowman Justin Kluwer chooses to take his from the air. Excellent! Oh, man, this is beautiful! The controls themselves are very responsive. You do feel any inputs that you make do have a, a reaction, so it's very fun to fly. Very similar to sailing, really. You, uh, you try not to stall, because <laughs> that's bad. went straight into it. We've come to Rio, we're halfway through the event. We have said that this was going to be our staging point where we were going to be fully on the speed and now we, are, we feel like we really have achieved that. What's the big picture plan here? For pirate skipper Paul Kayard, third overall is a great position considering the project started only 11 months ago. I would say the distance to the leader is a little more than I'd hoped for and, and the leading boat has proven to be significantly faster than the group. In all the times I've done this race, we've never had a boat that's that much faster than the rest of the fleet. While winning the race eight years ago on EF Language, Kayard's uncompromising attitude stunned his crew. From Cape Town to Australia, he didn't really, really want to listen to anybody. And he never let us put up a smaller sail. Or a bigger sail, bigger sail. We've got to keep pushing this thing. And it was awful. Being in charge means that you have to be able to say no sometimes, and uh, you're not everyone's friend. And um, I think leaders also have a certain aura about them that makes them a little less easy to approach, a little less approachable at times as a buddy-buddy. He's a guy in the Southern Ocean, I remember, you know, it's just dark, it's miserable, it's cold, you know, I had like frostbite on my fingers. You're like, what the hell are we doing in this hell hole? And here he is, you know, middle of the night, he doesn't need to be up, he's a skipper, he can kind of stay in his bunk, but there he is, doesn't take over, and he just stays up there, what do you need me to do, you want me to grind, whatever. Just comes in and fills in and gets the guys through the dark hours. Bain on, bain on, bain on. These nine months uh, wear on me pretty hard, but I'll, I'll bounce back from it. And uh, all in all, it's such a fantastic life experience that it's well worth the effort that uh, is required. weeks after arriving in Rio, the fleet returns to the racetrack for leg five to Baltimore. Winners of the Rio import race, Mike Sanderson's lead on ABN Amro 1 seems unassailable. 
but the battle still rages on the boats behind him. Just five and a half points separate second place from fourth. Leg five offers some of the most varied conditions in the race, with a return to the scoring gate of Fernando de Noronha and the challenge of trade winds, doldrums and the Gulf Stream before the notoriously tricky last 100 miles up the Chesapeake Bay to Baltimore. But with lighter winds forecast, race leader Abian Amro 1 may not have the advantage she's enjoyed so far. Uh, we know under six, seven knots of breeze, eight knots of breeze, the boat is, is sticky, but so it should be for some naval architecture reasons. On the other hand, we've also got to take some confidence from the fact that in 20 knots reaching, there's maybe not a whole lot they can do about that because, you know, we are wider and we are more powerful. Certainly the conditions on the next leg should be should be very much a leveller, I think, for all the boats. Uh, we know the ABM boats are quick reaching, but I think we've seen some good advances in the, the way the far boats, um, ourselves included, have developed sail inventories, and I think perhaps also because of the course on the next leg, there'll be not so much chance for boats to split apart, and we could see some very close racing. Restart day in Rio. The direction and strength of the wind, or lack of it, has preoccupied the minds of the team's weather analysts for several days. High up on Sugarloaf Mountain overlooking Guanabara Bay, Team AB and AMRO's weather gurus, Ken Campbell and Mike Quilter, scan the racetrack for the slightest sign of stronger winds. The man on the spot is AB and AMRO 1's navigator, Stan Honey. What's your hunch? Do you think we're going to get a southerly or do you think we're going to start in a northerly? Uh, it's very hard to say on the water, but considering how light it is where we are, I don't think it's got, it may not be uh, to that island that's in the middle there that you've got to leave to starboard. All righty, bye. So the southerly's made it just to that little island. With 25 minutes to the start, the Volvo fleet is all but becalmed. The weathermen have another 20 minutes to offer advice, but when the five-minute gun goes, the navigators are on their own. What's the time? 12.45. The foremost thing in their minds is going to be inside or outside here. Um, I still like outside, safer. Probably outside is safer. What's the time now? Cool About 30 be. seconds after the last time you <laughs> asked me, jeez, you're worse than my daughter. With less than 10 minutes to the start gun, almost miraculously, the sea breeze picks up to save the fleet. The boats prepare to sail upwind through the entrance to Guanabara Bay, round a buoy off Copacabana Beach, and head for the open sea. Getting a clean start is crucial. 30 seconds. 18. Desperate to do well in front of their huge local following, Torben Grail's Brazil 1 again crosses the start line early, a full 20 seconds early. Brazil 1's penalty is to return to the line and start again. Movistar gets the best start at the committee boat end of the line. Just a few minutes later, drama on ABN AMRO 1. It's the lock securing their jib that has failed. Before Mike Sanderson's crew can make the repair, they first have to retrieve the jib lock, and it's bowman Jan Decker who's hauled up the rig to get it. Bauer Becking has a headache too, his caused by being struck on the head by the boom. No stitches, but not the ideal start to two and a half weeks at sea.
In a strengthening 10-knot breeze on the approach to the entrance of Guanabara Bay, John Kostecki's Ericsson leads from Pirates of the Caribbean. ABN AMRO 2 and Movistar are close behind. At the boy off Copacabana Beach, it's Pirates of the Caribbean that heads the fleet after snatching the lead from Ericsson. Next mark on the course, the scoring gate of Fernando de Noronha, over 1,300 miles away. Light and variable winds are forecast for the next few days, squalls and showers too, but for now the boats are in breeze and back on track. For Pirates, an encouraging start and the chance to challenge for second place overall. Well, Jug, another nice start. That's why they have the big Jesus Christ over uh, Guanabara Bay to, for things like that. And they need to start at 110, the wind comes in at 105. The main concern for all the skippers is how best to avoid the pockets of light winds and thunderclouds that have seen the lead change hands constantly since the fleet left Rio. Negotiating the minefield of shifting winds and squalls is already testing the patience of the navigators. Clouds, bit of rain, little, little few maneuvers, bit of fight. Despite the problems with their jib just after the start, ABN AMRO 1 managed to claw their way back into the lead, only to lose ground again after making a short and unsuccessful detour inshore. We had a very tough night at the office, and uh, we're really interested to find out who invented yacht racing. Because it might be a lynching. This leg from Brazil to the USA is a huge test for our six boats. No monstrous waves or gale force winds in this part of the world, but the unique weather systems here present their own challenges. With over 4,000 miles of racing left, only 59 miles separates the leader, Movistar, from the back marker, ABN AMRO 2. On the way to Baltimore, our Volvo fleet have the opportunity to pick up more points at the Fernando de Noronha scoring gate before they head north towards the USA. Just short of the island, AB and AMRO 1 make their move on the leg leader. Movistar are suddenly looking over their shoulder. As darkness falls, AB and AMRO 1 close in. How far to go, Stan? Stan, seven miles. Seven miles. Yeah, we've just rounded the island of uh, Fernando and um, Lugastel was about a mile ahead, but they seem quite slow. I'm looking across his stern again. Two length separation, he's just got another way. Yeah, yesterday was an exciting day for Movie Star. Uh, we approached uh, Fernando de Noronha, that was one of the scoring waypoints, and uh, we had a close battle with uh, ABN1 again. Early in the morning there were like a little dot on the horizon and we just knew in these conditions we had like uh, reaching conditions 12 to 18 knots that they just go a little faster than us. So we knew we were in for a, for a tight one. So despite seeing an extensive lead disappear, Movistar still take the maximum three and a half points at Fernando de Noronha. ABN AMRO 1 passed the gate close behind but now lead the Spanish entry as the fleet head for the equator. As they continue north, Baltimore bound, Mike Sanderson's ABN AMRO 1 are gradually extending their lead. No time for despondency on the Spanish entry, however, as reaching the Northern Hemisphere sees King Neptune appear to mark Fernando Echeverri's first crossing of the equator. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. We've got one offender only this time. One defender, yes, I remember all of you many times. Are you? Yes, yes! We're actually just approaching the area where, uh, where the doldrums are starting. It looks like that we actually keep breeze the whole way, like uh, it might slow down to about five or six knots. 
but like what I said, it looks like we're keeping with some breeze so that we don't get stopped uh, completely. Uh, it will, of course, mean that the boats behind us uh, will gain quite a few miles because they're still sailing the old breeze. But hopefully we can pop out uh, on the other side a little quicker than they do and then extend again. So uh, keep fingers crossed. While ABN AMRO 1 and Movistar pull away from the rest of the Volvo fleet, a duel for third develops between Paul Kayart's Pirates of the Caribbean and Torben Grail's Brazil 1. Pirates of the Caribbean, in front of me, another thousand miles to the Caribbean. Now, I'm Dutch. I think my Navy still has a standing order to sink anything that displaces Jolly Roger, but we'll let them get away with it. However, rule one of being a pirate, you need a fast sea than your prey. Not today. Beating your rivals is one aim. Beating the heat is another. How's the conditions on board, Dinner? It's very hot, sweating, everything moist, no fans, it's miserable. It's 30 degrees in the water and about 35 degrees downstairs. But uh, the one thing that drives you nuts down here is uh, the guy on top of you sweating away, his sweat dripping through on top of you. And uh, number two, the extreme heat. And uh, there's one little chestnut we keep on board here to help us battle that. It's called the Halifan. There you see, as you can just see the shadow of her working away uh, over Dingo there, pushing a bit of air down, trying to circulate some of the smelly air around the boat down here. A beautiful little meal we have here of 30 supplements. The doctor must think I'm dying. We'll have a little uh, shot at how you get these down your throat in one go. That's what you call a power breakfast at sea. At the back, more than 50 miles behind the closest boat, the crew of ABN AMRO 2 make the most of the scant rainfall. <laughs> yeah, Joe, that's what you call the shower on board the ABN 2? Yeah, yeah. A little bit of boom showering? Let me get in. Oh, yeah, that's what you call a nice shower on ABN 2. Simeon is going to show us how his uh, shower on the screen, Volvo Ocean Race style. First, he's got to shampoo himself, you know, <laughs> rub every part of his body. And his girlfriend was complaining that he doesn't take a shower on board. Can you believe on that? No. We're going to turn on the shower for him. Life at the extreme. Less than 800 miles to the finish in Baltimore, leaders Avian AMRO 1 have slipped through the stationary cold front and into the building low pressure systems beyond. By reaching the new breeze first, the Dutch boat has increased its lead over Movistar to 50 miles. Although Sanderson and Honey's earlier move west was replicated by the rest of the fleet and any gains cancelled out. But in the highly localized and changeable conditions, the losses and gains from one sked to the next are enormous. And it's not long before Bauer Becking has better news to share with his crew. Pretty good sked, boys. Quite happy. Really? Well, the guys behind us have, uh, have light breeze as well. Oh, really? They've only uh, seven, eight knots of breeze. So even though we lost 26 miles to all of them behind us, we gained 24 miles on ABN. They're only 26 miles ahead. Same wind direction as us, and less pressure, so game on. <laughs> 30 miles down the fleet, Ericsson has been making gains at the expense of Brazil 1, who have been relegated to fifth position in a battle that promises to last all the way to Baltimore. 
had a um, fantastic sort of night there, hooting along, uh, just like great speeds going. of 20 knots. But just down over here at the moment, we've got the uh, Brazilians. Uh, they took quite a bit out of us last night, but in the last few hours, we managed to get a couple of miles back on them. So uh, they're the ones we're battling with at the moment. We've got a fire about 30 miles that way. So we've got to keep them behind us and mow the boys down up here. And our chip's flapping, so I better pay attention. At the back of the Volvo fleet is ABN AMRO 2. After losing touch with the fleet completely earlier in the leg, a 62-mile gain has put Seb Joss's crew back within catching distance of Brazil 1 and Ericsson. After more than two weeks at sea, the rapidly changing conditions have meant long, tiring vigils below for the navigators and exhausting watches for the crews. Baltimore and its attractions can't come soon enough. Over 100 miles up the Chesapeake Bay, some 200 inland from the Atlantic, Baltimore and the restart city of Annapolis further south represent the last extended stopover of the race. On offer are three weeks to recover from leg five and prepare for the transatlantic dash to Portsmouth via a pit stop in New York. Day 16, Rio to Baltimore, and ABN AMRO 1 makes its way up Chesapeake Bay towards the finish line. Over 4,950 miles behind it, less than 50 to go. Renowned for its capricious winds, tides and sandbanks, the Chesapeake's challenges have so far been slow to materialize. The threat from Mobistar has also yet to appear, still some 30 miles behind. The Chesapeake Bay Bridge is the last major landmark en route to what looks like being their fourth leg win from five attempts. But with less than three miles to the finish, the black boat simply stops, trapped in light air and fighting a one-knot current. Sanderson's men resort to dropping anchor. Behind them, rivals Movistar are closing at 13 knots raising the spectre of ABN AMRO 1's defeat in Wellington at the hands of the Spanish entry at the end of leg three. By the time the breeze fills in again for ABN AMRO 1, Movistar are less than 20 miles in arrears. It's a relieved Mike Sanderson that finally crosses the line 15 days, two hours and 47 minutes after leaving Rio. This is a childhood dream of mine since I was five years old. Everything I've done has been to try and uh one day hope to skipper a Volvo boat so uh, never the novelty never wears off it's never less special and um, yeah, this is another fantastic one after a very tough leg 16 and a half miles behind when their rivals finish Movistar takes another five hours to complete the windless approach to the line agonizingly slow it may have been but with ABN AMRO 2 stuck at the back of the fleet, the Spanish entry's second place on leg five lifts it from fourth to second position overall. Yeah, I think we can be pretty comfortable how the, the whole leg went because we were nearly weak in the lead and they didn't lose too much in the end against ABN 1. So congratulations to them. They, they just have an awesome boat they, and they sailed well. So they deserve winners, but of course second place is good because uh, yeah, with the scoring by point for points as well, we, we had a very good leg. Ten hours later, Pirates of the Caribbean sail in on a healthy morning breeze to take third place. It's a result which drops them back to fourth overall, but leaves them just half a point adrift of ABN AMRO 2 and only one and a half points behind rivals Movistar. Uh, we've made it here now, we've got our podium spot and um, you know, we're going to be duking it out with Movistar and uh, if they think they're going to uh, you know, get away easy, they've got another thing coming. Just two hours later, the leg-long battle for fourth and fifth place reaches its conclusion. After damaging a head sole 150 miles from the finish in a squall and forfeiting a 20-mile lead over Brazil 1, John Kostecki's Ericsson fight to the last to claw back the mile that separates them from the Brazilians. 
But having covered Kostecki's every step since then, it's Torben Grail's boat that takes fourth position by just 13 minutes, increasing their lead over the Swedish boat in the race overall. We had a very hard leg, so beating uh, Ericsson here at the finish of the leg was uh, a, a good boost for the, for, the, for the guys. For Ericsson, a more competitive leg than the last, but despite the crew reshuffle in Rio, just five points for the leg and fifth position is their only reward. No, I'm not happy. I mean, uh, I like to win races, um, and I think there's a lot of things that we can continue to improve upon to up our game and become better. Second into Cape Town and Melbourne, fifth into Wellington and third into Rio, ABN AMRO 2's last place in Baltimore is a new and unwelcome experience for Seb Joss's crew. So with their fourth leg win of the race, ABN AMRO 1 now have a yawning 22-point lead. But below them it's a different story, just a point and a half separating Movistar in second from Pirates in fourth. In fifth place it's Brazil 1, Ericsson still struggling in sixth. ABN AMRO 1's stranglehold on the race gets ever tighter. And you can follow their progress in our weekly updates every Friday night on ITV4. Mathematically, it's still not over, but if Mike Sanderson carries on at this rate, overall victory can't be far away.